Well, Sanner, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. The weather looks beautiful down there in Raleigh. It is. We finally got a little bit of sun here. It's been a lot of rain for the last couple of weeks. So I know we've got a, a few job sites that are very happy to see the sun these days. I would say that. It's all, it's all, all, all hands to the pump now. The good weather's coming in. Well, listen, thank you very much for, for making the time to speak with us. Um, we've been in dialogue for a couple of months now, just kind of getting an idea in your background. And I think your background um, right now is exactly what the Pre-Construction Podcast is all about. It's all about pre-construction technology. It's all about getting a bigger picture on what's going on. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, for the guys and gals that don't know you well, give us a quick 30-second overview of where you're at, what you're doing, and who you're working with. Yeah, so I'm Vice President of Pre-Construction with Skanska at our North Carolina, Virginia office. So we're based out of Durham here. Uh, obviously, I mean, folks know Skanska, but our business here in, in North Carolina uh, is, is generally a CM at risk business. I've been with Skanska 15 years now on both the, the pre-con and operations side of the business. Um, but we've got a, a great team here of about 15 folks uh, that support a, a wide range of projects, higher ed, healthcare, commercial, municipal type work. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great spot to be, a lot, lot going on. Good, exciting. Yeah, looking forward to getting through all, all of it. I'm just, I'm just conscious of that one hour or so that we have. We could probably stretch this to five hours easy. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right back then. Duke University um, did your bachelor's. Give us an, an idea of, of what you touched on uh, during the bachelor's. I mean, you may have listened to a, a couple of other podcasts, but it's something that I really like to, to dive deep into about what the, the, the kids are actually getting taught and how relevant it is. Yeah, so I, I did um, structural engineering for my undergrad. Um, it was a, a relatively theoretical program at the time, and I've, I've stayed pretty involved at the engineering school at Duke over the years, and, and they've made some really good shifts to be a more practical, hands-on uh, engineering program and integrating a lot more hands-on design into the curriculum since I graduated. Um, but I did a lot with, with some different extracurricular organizations, a, a motorsports team uh, that really got me some great experience and kind of hands-on design and construction and understanding how you design to make something buildable. Uh, and we also had a, a great program um, that was just kind of getting conceived while I was at Duke, the, the Smart House, which was um, a living learning laboratory that uh, really a dorm that students lived in, but were able to do projects on new innovative technologies tremendous sustainability efforts. So the timing uh, worked out great. I've, I've been very fortuitous in, in my career with some good timing. And the Smart House was just starting its design of, of that actual building when I was uh, a sophomore, junior, senior. And so I was able to be involved kind of as an owner's rep, essentially, in a voice of, of the student perspective through that design process. So I got to attend a lot of design meetings with the architect, engineers, which really gave me tremendous insight into what the process looked like um, which was unique because Duke didn't have classes in construction management. There were a couple classes in architectural engineering, which I took and were great, but that, that was kind of what opened the door to me to the whole building process and, and all the opportunities that were there. Brilliant. And then give me a quick um, rundown on the masters. What was the thinking behind the masters? Was that something that you always wanted to do even through your, your bachelor's or was that something that you thought, you know what, I might as well continue on here and secure it? Yeah, so it was, it was a little bit of an interesting circumstance. I, uh, as I got into my senior year, um, only needed a, a few more credits to graduate just because of AP credits and a couple things through my uh, undergrad. And um, Duke being a relatively small structural engineering program, the capstone design class that I had to take to graduate was only offered in the spring. So there's no way for me to graduate early. Um, I had to be there for the full year. So it was down to either double majoring in econ, taking a few extra fun uh, phys ed classes, or Duke had this one year master's of engineering management program, which is sort of a condensed MBA program for engineers and other technical majors that really hits on the management, the project management, the finance, the intellectual property, all those kind of core business skills that a lot of engineers don't get right away, unless you go back and, and get an MBA. So um, that was a really interesting opportunity. And I was able to start taking those classes essentially during my senior year. And I stayed one extra semester to finish up the master's and um, it was a, a very interesting program. I think the dividends that it paid uh, really came later in my career at year, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and beyond. Um, I, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that, you know, the first couple of years out of, out of school, I, I felt like I wasn't getting to use a, a whole lot of what I, I learned in that master's program. But 
um, certainly as the years went on, I, I found myself drawing back on a lot of that information, um, especially as I got involved in more kind of national initiatives and cultural change management things uh, within Skanska. Brilliant. Yeah, because that was my next question is, do you think it was valuable? And would, would you kind of give advice to young people considering doing a master's right now, at, at just straight after bachelor's? Would you advise them to do it then? Or would you advise to, to wait five or six years and then maybe do it on a part time basis? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of that depends on the individual's circumstances and what their ambitions are. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of knew going in that I wasn't um, someone who wanted to always be out at job sites building jobs. Um, I, I love that part of the business and really enjoyed my time doing that. But uh, I, I knew I was interested in, in tackling more of the larger business type challenges. And so from that perspective, uh, having some of those additional master's courses really helped me. And, and I, I knew personally, I didn't want to uh, get out of that mode of thinking and, and uh, have to restart kind of the academic side of my brain again in a few years. So it made more sense for me to just keep doing that, get the master's done and, and uh, move on into industry. But I think everybody's a little bit different and depending on kind of your, your circumstances and, and really what your end goals are um, from the program, it, either way can work for people. Brilliant, yeah, and and then of course finish the masters. Now you're ready to ready to rock and roll in the big bad world of construction, straight into Skanska on the operations side. Um, how v- valuable were those operational projects as a project engineer, project manager for the five, six, seven years that you you, you did them? Yeah, so it was, it was kind of interesting. Actually, I was hired to go into the operations side of the business, but um, the project that I was going to start on ended up getting delayed, hung up in pre-construction. And so I actually, I did an internship between my undergrad and the last semester of my master's and ended up doing that internship essentially with the pre-construction team because of that, that delay in the project timing. And because of that, when I got hired full-time, they brought me back into the pre-con team. Um, You know, they they wanted to to bring me on. And so I spent my first three years or so in pre-con and kind of reached a point where it was obvious that I needed to go out in the field, see how things were built, uh, just to, to take those next steps in my career. So um, spent about eight years then in operations. Uh, I got to build a couple of great projects with some great teams and, and really challenging, unique projects that were very collaborative, which again, you know, some of that I think was, was lucky circumstance that the timing worked out really well, but um, that was just tremendously important for me and in, in my growth and development, understanding how things get built um, and it, it provided me that springboard to come back to pre-construction then, um, which is about four years ago, uh, and, and have a much better perspective on how we plan our projects, uh, you know, not just from an estimating and cost standpoint, but from all the other things that we have to think about, the logistics, the schedule, um, and, and just kind of shepherding that, that whole process, the interface between the design team, the owner, all of our internal stakeholders to, to try to make that project su- successful and, and set it up to, to execute well when it does start construction. Brilliant, yeah, so full cycle. Full cycle. Um, you, re- you really did get the, the benefit of it. Um, and then Rally, was there any t- particular types of projects that you guys were doing or were you working on national projects? Yeah, so I mean, myself locally, I- I've tended to be particularly involved in higher ed projects. We do a tremendous amount of work at NC State, at Duke, um, and really at, at almost all the higher ed universities here in North Carolina, Virginia, uh, between you know Western Carolina, UNC, um, Longwood, Virginia Tech, UVA, Radford, William and Mary, VSU, um, we're we're a, a big higher ed builder in this region. Uh, we also do a tremendous amount of healthcare um, and, and a fair amount of kind of public work for you know the the local counties and cities in this area as well. So that's it's going to be a good opportunity to to really have a, a diverse background of different types of projects as well. But um, to your point, Skanska does a great job of resource sharing around the country. Uh, so we often will pull in expertise from other other regions uh, and support other regions as well. I've had opportunities to to work with our teams in Arizona and California and uh, New York, New Jersey and Atlanta and Florida, uh, Philly, uh, helping them with with pursuits um, and, and projects through the precon process. So uh, it's made it very easy to, to kind of plug in and help lend some of that expertise uh, where it's helpful. Brilliant. Yeah. So you, you started in pre-con, you went to operations, you're back in pre-con. Are we, I hope we're not going to lose you to the dark side again, are we? Well, I, I tell you, I, I, I love um, the pre-con space because it's such a great 
opportunity to influence projects um, early on. You know, that was that was one of the things as I was working through operations and and um, you know I loved the problem solving aspects of being out in the field and and all those challenges that were thrown at you every day. But I, I really started to realize that the opportunity to influence the direction that the job goes in terms of what that final building looks like. You know, I'm, I'm particularly passionate about sustainability. So some of those decisions, a lot of that happens at the very beginning of the project. So once we're in construction and you're out building a job, the opportunity to influence that end result is, is fairly diminished. But when we're working on the job in, in the early phases with our project planning group, um, there really is, is much more opportunity to, to impact the direction the job goes. And so I, I love that piece of it. I, I love that I can touch a number of different jobs um, and it also gives me the opportunity to plug into more national initiatives, uh, whether it's technology, data, sustainability, um, you know, a lot of those things that, that I get excited about. So um, I, I think a lot of times when you're in the operation side of the business, it's re really easy to fall into that trap. Being at the job site, you've got your head down, you're focused on building your job, um, and, and you lose sight of, of some of the bigger things that are going on around you. So uh, being in the, the project planning world here has given me an opportunity to, to tie into a lot, a lot of those things more frequently. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you mentioned, you touched on a couple of the, the, those just now, the pre-construction technology side of it, because you are heavily involved and have been for the last five or six years on Skanska's efforts within pre-construction technology, but more, most importantly as well, data. So let's, let's jump straight into um, the pre-construction technology first so that we can give a kind of a holistic uh, approach to it and then how the data integrates with that. So Five years ago, let's let's go back. What was the thinking within Skanska five years of, ago about pre-construction technology? How was it viewed? What, what was it? Was it was that the the start of it? Do you think uh, BIM VDC assemble? Well, it's it's funny actually. When I did my first uh, tour of duty, so to speak, in precon back in I guess would have been two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. That time frame, uh, I was actually part of a, a small national team that was looking at using. BIM in pre-construction, we were doing a lot of takeoff with Revit, um, you know, pulling quantities out of models. Uh, that was obviously pretty early on in that journey. So there were a lot of challenges we were working through on model quality standards, uh, you know, how we make sure the information is accurate. Um, but, you know, that, that gave me a really early exposure to what was possible. Obviously, I left for operations for a period of time. And by the time I came back, there were great strides now in, in other programs like Assemble that make the visualization and extraction process a lot easier for estimators. You don't have to worry about folks learning a, a program that's a little bit more or maybe a little less user intuitive like, like Revit is. Um, so that's made it a lot easier now for us over the last five years to really push forward on um, helping our folks rethink the, the quantity takeoff process from what happens in 2D to looking at a building in 3D. And um, I, I think the thing that we've really tried to focus on with people is the idea that doing takeoff out of a model is not just, hey, give me the quantities that are in the model, right? We, we do so much of our work is, is progress design work. Because we're a, a CM at risk, we're involved in almost all of our projects in the schematic phase all the way through going to GMP. And so almost all the estimates that we do are on partial design documents. They're incomplete by nature. And so our job is to fill in the gaps and our folks are good at doing that. And they've, they've been very good at doing that in 2D. And they understood how to take a set of 2D documents and, and figure out how they need to fill things in in OST or, or whatever other program they're using, but helping them transition that, that mindset and that mentality to 3D because the, the natural inclination is, well, I've got a model, it's got quantities, here are my quantities. But the reality is we have to get them capable and fluent in looking at a model, dissecting it, understanding what's accurate, what's not accurate, and, and being able to kind of get in the designer's head a little bit and understand how they're modeling the information that we're getting to understand where the geometries are accurate, where they're not accurate, so that we can uh, figure out, okay, here's the information we can get out of the model, but now what do we have to do with that to produce our estimate? Because most times it's, it's not going to be as simple as here's my quantity of steel out of the model, but we have to think about what's missing, what's incomplete, uh, what's going to happen between the set of DD documents to the final 100% CDs, because that's where we want our estimate to be, even at the DD phase. So that's that's kind of been the the process that we've really been focusing on with our folks over the last few years is is helping them transition that filling in the gaps mindset to a 3D space and and get more comfortable using tools like Assemble to QC a model 
to really be able to use it to its full advantage. Yeah. And again, filling in the gaps is really difficult unless you've been in, on the field for five, 10 years, really understanding that. So really the only way to do it, filling in the gaps is through experience or historical data is going through it and looking through it. Okay, very good. And five years obviously is 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 a long time. Five years ago, the pre-construction technology, BIM, VDC, Assemble, was that the start of, of the collection of data within within Skanska? How, how did that process come about? Um, how, did you guys have to do a blueprint, a foundations of how it was going to go? Yeah, so, you know, I think we were probably like a lot of other folks in that historical data, you know, when we were doing benchmarking exercises or, or conceptual efforts, uh, you know, people had their own little spreadsheet where they had kept track of, of jobs and, and what they cost and um, you know, you'd have below the line factors where you're escalating it to today's dollars or normalizing it across regions. And, you know, those spreadsheets would get passed around from person to person, office to office. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of had to cross your fingers and, and hope that the, the information was accurate and hadn't been uh, kind of manipulated too much um, over whatever history it had, because who knows where that file came from necessarily. Uh, and so we realized there was a tremendous opportunity to do more with uh, standardizing some of that information, cleaning it up, and not just thinking about cost, but, but thinking about some of the other things that we could look at from a benchmarking standpoint. And so uh, to, to your question about five years ago, we looked at how we could totally revamp that benchmarking process. And uh, we actually sat down and looked at our kind of five core market sectors. And we looked at each one individually and thought, Here's the data that we would love to have if we were analyzing buildings. I and mean, we looked at it system by system with a uniformat approach. Um, so, you know, here's the cost data we would want in uniformat structure. Here's the level of detail we would want. Um, and then for each building system, here is what we would want. You know, it's how much concrete is in the foundations, how much rebar, what type of structure is it? Is it on, you know, what type of foundation system does it have? All the way through every system in the building. And then for each market sector, what is some of the market sector specific data that we would want to have in terms of how's, how's the program allocated or, um, you know, what are some of those unique factors? And so we went through this whole journey of identifying all that data, getting a standardized process to collect it and, and QC it and organize it and, and ultimately then bring it together, aggregate it, visualize it. And You'd, you'd mentioned earlier about that challenge of filling in the gaps and how do you do it? It's either experience or historical data. Well, you know, now we've built a tool that allows us to put historical data kind of at the fingertips of everybody on our team so that the, the younger estimators who are, you know, two or three years of experience um, can, can go in and see, hey, from a steel structure, you know, looking at lab buildings in, in this region, uh, what do we expect to see in terms of a pounds per square foot for a steel structure or how many cubic yards of concrete in the foundation system, um, which we think is really helpful to them to, to kind of catch them up on some of that historical intuition that, that you know, our, our folks who have 20 or 30 years doing this, they, they know that kind of stuff right off the top of their head. But um, this really makes that information uh, more accessible to, to everybody within our, our project planning group. Yeah, because this is my big, it's not a pet hate, but the, the idea that you can't go straight into pre-construction without field experience, I think we're we're kind of eliminating a lot of candidates and especially graduates that want to get involved in construction, can see themselves in construction, but don't want to go in and and, and lay bricks or, or do drywall um, to get that experience to go into pre-construction. They actually can, and if they've got that, that left-hand side of the brain thinking, they can go straight into pre-construction through BIM modeling, through historical data, learn as quickly as someone. And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't do that. And the best way is definitely to go and build something before you go into pre-construction. But I think, I just think, because pre-construction and estimating the talent, there's such a lack of talent there. We've got to open our minds up to bringing people straight out of out of an IT people, preferably. So competing with the big IT companies, bringing them in and merging and kind of like a reverse mentorship, merging the 20, guy, 20 years of experience of the guy that had on site with the IT brain. Um, so this this fits in perfectly. And how, how difficult was it kind of getting buy-in from leadership and, and, and other parts of and other departments within Skanska? Yes, I mean, you know, we had 
leadership buy-in from the top. Um, our, our national executive vice president who leads our, our project planning effort, um, who, who is actually my, my first boss who hired me into, into pre-con here, um, you know, he was leading this charge from, from day one. So uh, that was critical, obviously, because one of the big challenges we faced early on was once we said, hey, here are these couple hundred data points that we want to collect on projects, that, that took some time, right? So we were asking our teams around the country, hey, we need you to collect all of this information when you finish your GMP and wrap up this project. And some of it was, hey, you, you got to trust us. Um, there, there's going to be a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, but right now we're still building the rainbow, so to speak. And um, th that was a challenge. You know, it, it took a lot of uh, constant reminding that, hey, this is important. We need to do this. Um, and, and explaining the value proposition to people. But the reality was we couldn't show them what the final project, pr final product was going to look like until we had the data to actually start, you know, building the tool. So, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of pushing and, and uh, cajoling to get people bought into the, the data collection process uh, until we could at least get a critical mass to start building the initial reports and visualizations. Uh, but once we got to that point, then it, it really could pick up some steam because we could show people, hey, this is, this is why you collected all that data. This is why you spent an extra, you know, eight hours at the end of the project filling out all this information, because now look at this, you know, now we can see data on 100, 200, 300 projects and start to use this to draw conclusions, whether we're doing, you know, early phase conceptual estimates or trying to fill in the gaps or validate those SD or DD efforts or, or trying to be smarter about how we do value management, because now we can look at how a project compares to a bunch of other projects and see where, things are trending, you know, above or, or below where we might expect it to and, and use data to really drive more informed decision making there as well. So, yeah, I think having something that we could we could really show people how it applies to their workflows that that really helped connect the dots and, and build the momentum. But it, it's a it's a journey. Um, it, it really takes time. And, you know, it's, it's funny um, now that we're involved in kind of trying to replicate uh, some of what we've done with this tool more broadly throughout the business, you know, people want, want those results really quickly. And we have to remind people what we did in pre-con was, has been a five-year journey now. And it's, it's taken that long to really bear fruit. And there, there's an old proverb, I think it's a Chinese proverb that, that we like to remind people of that, you know, the, the best time to, to plant a tree was, you know, 30 years ago. And it's, it's kind of the same thing with, with a data journey. The best time to start that journey was, was 10 years ago or five years ago. And um, now the, the second best time is today. So, you know, it's, if we didn't start five years ago, let's, let's at least start making the investments today on, on what we can do going forward. And, and so that's, that's really where, we're, where we are now, looking at what other parts of our process can we really standardize the data collection, whether it's how we approach value management or how we approach uh, you know, some of our other items more in the field, constructability, uh, pursuit efforts, how we build teams, all, all those kind of things. There are just tremendous opportunities now as we think about uh, applying that kind of data-driven mindset throughout the business. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. The long game, and you can see that. I mean, I deal with e our top 400s right down to, to the one-man bands, startup construction companies, and you can see that the, the companies that are doing that are playing the long game, and they will get they will get the benefits of that. How satisfying, from your point of view, was it? I mean, you've been doing it now for five years. I mean, are you seeing it every day, every project? Are you just seeing the benefit of it day in, day out? You know, um, it was interesting. We had a, uh, a project that we were pursuing um, for a, a public school system here. It was late last year. And you know, it was a CM at risk project, you know, kind of typical procurement in this region where we submit an RFP. It's a generally a qualifications-based selection. Um, and you know, we submit the RFP, we do the interview and we go through our interview, you know, it's a very short interview and we have a, a piece on the pre-construction process. I, I have a, a very short segment on Scanska metrics just because we're so short on time. Um, and, you know, the, the very, we finished the interview, we, we do Q and A. The very first thing that, that the client said was, you know, before we start questions, I just want to say how impressed I was with that data tool. Um, it really is, uh, you know, a tremendous value that, that we see in, in using that. And so, um, yeah, it, it's incredibly rewarding when, when you hear a client uh, start Q&A with, with a statement about how, how impressed they are with, with something you've built. And so we're, we're starting to see that more and more across the business as, as we get more savvy with uh, how to use the tool, how to articulate its value um, and, and get it in front of clients. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I don't mean to get kind of down a rabbit hole here, but 
um, applying data in our industry is, is still such a, a new and unique thing. And so, um, you know, we, we saw it as we were doing some of the training around how to use the tool for our people throughout pre-con and, um, it, it's just different. People have to, to get into that kind of analytical mindset and, and being able to articulate the value add of data takes time for people because it's, it's just something different. And so, um, you know, we have progressed a, a t- tremendous amount in how we sell this tool and how we articulate the value proposition to our clients, even from where we were when we first developed the tool and, and rolled it out. And I think that's helped a lot as well. Um, it's it's easy to to build something and want to show it off, and you can confuse the hell out of people because you've got a whole bunch of charts and visuals and graphs, and you're you're talking data. Um, but I, I think we've gotten a lot smarter about how we story tell with data and communicate the value add, uh, I don't want to say in layman's terms, but but in ways that really resonate with people um, more than simply just blowing them away with a whole bunch of, of data and visualizations. Yeah. And well, you, you hit something on the hit nail on the head there right now. Being able to discuss things in layman's terms is a skill as far as I'm concerned. And, and it's, it's pretty evident that you're really good at it. But if you can do that and communicate really well and visually show them, I mean, that, that has to be a, a winner because, I mean, as we know, estimators and pre-construction, generally a little bit on the introverted side. So communication doesn't become, come natural. And that's not everyone. That's just the, the kind of the, what I see. But being able to show people visually, and we're all visual people, whether it's in, internal stakeholders or clients, architects, designers. Um, so that's valuable. And just without giving too much away, the visualization part, is that built into your tool at Scanska or have you added on a, a visualization tool uh, off the shelf? Yeah, so we we use uh, Microsoft Power BI as our visualization platform. So uh, we collect and aggregate all the data in a separate tool. And then Microsoft Power BI basically points to all that data. We developed custom reports, obviously, that, um, you know, part of our our whole process on, you know, what data do we want to collect? How do we want to use it? Uh, Kind of the the end of that, not the end, but one of the later steps in that journey is how do we want to visualize that information to help our people use it to draw insights, right? So, um, and and part of that is is the whole challenge of how do we appropriately normalize the data um, because all the buildings that we build are are very different. They're, you know, and and we don't tend to build uh, simple buildings that are are repeated over and over. They tend to be the more complex, challenging, you know, uh, whether it's site constraints or addition renovation stuff or whatever it might be. So, um, really being thoughtful about how we organize and present the data in a way that helps people draw the right conclusions from the information. That's, that's really a, a critical piece of it and something that, you know, we, we had to go through a lot of iterations to uh, arrive where we are now. And, and we, we actually, well, one of the things I think we've done really well is, is embrace this plan, do, check, act uh, methodology in our process. And, you know, we've, we've got a team right now that's working on kind of what we call Gen 2. So what are the, the revisions that, that we want to make to the tool to continue to, to improve it? You know, what data are we missing? What data are we not using? What visualizations should be tweaked or adjusted to make them more helpful to our people? Um, so, you know, that's, that's a, a constant iterative process to really refine uh, because it's, it's, tricky. Again, people aren't used to, to looking at visualizations and drawing conclusions. So it's really important, I think, from our end and building the tool to make sure that we're setting them up to be successful and, and building it in a way that helps them draw the right insights. And the other piece of that, you, you were kind of um, tiptoeing around this, is, is helping people with kind of data literacy. Um, and this was an interesting thing. You know, when we, we rolled out the tool and you know, it's kind of like, here it is, go use it. And we realized very quickly that we needed to do more training, not just on, hey, here's Power BI, here's how to navigate it, here's how to filter and and access the reports and all that stuff. But here is how to apply it to a process. Here's how, you know, here, here's what visuals you might want to look at in this given scenario. So here's, you know, we, we give people examples and um, we, we kind of say, okay, you're you're doing an estimate and you've taken off the structural steel and maybe it's, you know, uh, design development, and you've come up with a, a certain tonnage, maybe it's 11 pounds per square foot on average over the whole building. Um, now what? Okay, well, here's a visual that shows you the pounds of steel per square foot. And here's how you could add in your project to see how it compares to all these other projects. 
Okay, now what? Well, you, how does your project stack up? Is it a little low? Well, what conclusions would you draw there? Is it low because the design is incomplete? Maybe the engineer of record hasn't thought about the lateral bracing system yet. Okay, well, that's a conversation that you could have with them about, hey, is there maybe some more steel that could show up in this design when we get to 100% CDs? Is there an allowance that we might wanna add to accommodate that and use the data to determine what that allowance is? Or maybe our tonnage is higher than we might expect. Well. Is there a reason in the design that that would be the case? Is the geometry kind of funky? Is, are there you know, transfer beams because of, of column layouts that are driving the tonnage maybe to be higher than we expect? Are there vibration requirements because of the program that are gonna drive the tonnage up? Kind of getting people into this analytical thought process of, of why, kind of, you, know, you gotta ask why five times to get to the root of the problem um, to be able to couple their knowledge of cost drivers and building systems with the data to then help them work through that process and draw better conclusions and produce better estimates. So um, we really had to think about developing a training. We did develop a training that, that kind of got into a lot of those examples to help people understand how to use data in their process. Uh, now we, we did that and then we realized we, we need a little more training on things like data fluency, just kind of understanding, hey, here are different types of visuals, bar charts, pie charts, you know, stack bar charts, histograms, box and whisker plots. Um, and when you can use different types of visuals to look at data in different ways and draw different conclusions. And so, um, you know, that's, that's been a side project of mine over the last couple of months is, is building out a training around data literacy, just to help people understand how we think about data and data quality and data aggregations and basic data analysis um, to help support some of that. Because, you know, there are some, some great examples of folks I've seen where you know, they're, they're using our tool and they gravitate right to, here's the average, you know, here, here's the average of, of the 15 projects. Well, you know, there are some times when the average isn't what you want to look at. Maybe you want to look at the median of the data, because if you look at how it's distributed, you know, you might have some outliers on one side of the data set or, um, you know, something else going on that might be skewing the average. And, and so, uh, as we start using data a lot more in our workflows, we have to get a little bit smarter about some of the analysis to make sure that we're drawing the right conclusions through that process. And so uh, we're, we're working on some of that training. That's something that I I'm, I'm, have on my to-do list to try to get done and rolled out here in the next couple months um, for our team to really help them be a little bit more confident in, in kind of speaking that data language and, and using it the right way to draw the right conclusions through that process. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, any any sort of technology, any sort of change management, uh, you got to pivot your way through it and you, you will get. But I would imagine it's a, it's an ever changing landscape. Um, uh, was there any over the last five or six years, were there, was there any kind of aha moment where you went, you know what, we're going to have to fundamentally pivot towards this or this is going to be a this is going to be the future of, of where we're going or, or we're going to have to use this technology or we're going to have to kind of tweak it this way you know it, it's it's been really kind of fun to see as as this pre-construction tool has picked up steam and and gained adoption and we've been more effective using it and adding value with it and in turn then selling that to our clients using it as a differentiator um it, it's been really fun to see the momentum that that has picked up throughout the business, right? So now uh, we've got a, another team that works with scheduling and scheduled data who are building a similar tool and they're getting ready to roll that out so that we can analyze scheduled data in a similar way to what we've done with cost and, and kind of building parameter data. Um, and, and, you know, I think in a lot of ways, the tool that we built on the pre-construction side has been sort of the, the early example of what is possible uh, for us within Skanska that has gotten everybody's eyes, you know, wide open to the opportunity that's in front of us with data across the whole business. And, and um, I, I think that's been really great in getting everyone serious about, about the opportunities that are there. And um, you know, again, the timing is really good because we're going through our uh, business plan cycle right now. And, and so I'm, I'm part of that team that's working on how we develop our data strategy for the business plan. And, and so, you know, a lot of that is thinking about how can we learn from what we've done on the pre-con side and, and kind of spread that success throughout the business. And, um, you know, I think had we not had the success to, to point to and, and to learn from, it would be a, a more challenging process to, to spread it more broadly throughout the business.
Brilliant. Uh, and, I ho- and I hope, and there will be loads of people listening to this that'll be taking real, real confidence from this. Um, well, so thank you. A quick one as well I want to speak to you about, because, I, I mean, as I said, you, there'll be a lot of people listening to this saying, we're, we're way at the beginning, we're way behind. What advice for a $120 million a year general contractor, commercial general contractor, thinking about data and not knowing where to start? What qu- quick two minutes advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, certainly being a little bit of a, a smaller company certainly helps. Um, you know, we, we have the challenge of trying to standardize things across, uh, you know, 15 or 20 offices around the country, um, which is its own challenge. But if you're just dealing with one, one office, one team, uh, that makes things a little bit easier because it's, it's all under your control a little bit more. Um, but I, I think the big thing is, is just thinking about where you see opportunities to drive data-driven insights in your process, whether that's on the cost benchmarking side, conceptual estimating, uh, you know, estimate validation and, and filling in those gaps, improving your value management process. Um, I, I think starting by really understanding where you want to get the value and what is that business problem you're trying to solve, I, I think that's critical because a lot of times we can fall into the trap of, hey, here's a whole bunch of data that that we have, whether it's you know, data that's in our accounting tool, data that's in our estimating program, data that's in our, uh, you know, HR system, whatever it might be, we have access to a lot of data. Um, but it, it can become really easy to just take that and try to dump it into a visualization tool, whether that's Microsoft Power BI or something else. But I think to be really successful, you have to have your, your eyes on what is that value proposition? What is the business problem that I'm trying to solve? And then really focus in on what is the data that's going to help me solve that? Because again, there's so much data out there. You really, I think, want to focus in on where that value add is going to come. What are the key pieces of data that are going to help you solve those problems? And then focus in on that. So you're not trying to tackle everything. You're really zoning in on uh, what's going to help you drive business decisions um, and and solve that that business problem uh, and, and avoid getting kind of bogged down in everything that's out there and and just kind of trying to throw information into a, a report or a visualization for the sake of having a visualization, uh, really thinking through how are people going to use this information? How are they going to draw conclusions from it? What data do I need to facilitate that? And then how can I make sure I've got good data? Um, because again, the, the data quality is critical, right? You know, the old garbage in, garbage out situation. Um, and so, you know, something that we're doing uh, as, as part of our overall data strategy is, is that prioritization, right? Here are all the things that we see as opportunities throughout the business, whether it's operations, HR, BD, pre-con, um, here are all those opportunities. Here's the data it takes for each one of those. And then how hard is it to get that data and put that uh, visualization together from an aggregation and analysis standpoint? And, and you know, low complexity, high value, those are the easy targets, some things are going to be a lot harder because the data is either not available or it's really dirty. It's, you know, messy because of how it's collected. It's not, you know, organized. We're using uh, different project names and different tools. So it's hard to aggregate the data. Um, so, you know, going through that process of assessing your data quality and, and how complex it'll be to build the visualization, that, that's important too, to understand just how much work is going to be involved in, in getting to that end state uh, before you start too far down the path. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, you've got to have a clear pathway. Um, you've got to almost got to think about the, the 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 final problem that you're going to be solved, and then kind of work back from there. And the big thing that that I see is collaboration. Um, obviously, we call it a three legged stool here on the the pre construction podcast. You've got the client, the architect, and the contractor. With that collaboration and, and what you're talking about, the tool, the, the, the data, the visualization, do you share, and even down as far as a subcontractor, what way is the, the data kind of distributed and how much, is there administrative kind of levels that, that people can look at? Does your client get to have a look at your data throughout the project? Is it is it not real time, but does it um, does it give them a good idea of how it's tracking, how it's, the schedule's going? And then on the subcontractor side, their data, the data that they give you, are they involved at an early stage contributing to, to this? Yeah, so a couple of things I would say there. Um, 
you know, first kind of at the, the major milestones where we're doing a, a full estimate deliverable at schematic design or design development. Um, what we've done now is add a section to our, our deliverable book that focuses on analysis. So what we're doing is integrating visualizations from that tool into that final report and, and giving just quick little snapshots of, of some of the conclusions and analysis that we're doing. So, um, you know, back to that steel example, hey, here's, here's the steel that we saw in our analysis doing our takeoff for the project. Here's how we saw that compared to other projects. Here are the conclusions that we drew. Here are the conversations that we had. And here's the result of this. And Mr. Owner, we've included this analysis to try to fill that gap that we identified through our, our data-driven analysis. And so um, we're, we're really trying to include that more in our deliverables to make sure that we're communicating and articulating how we're using data in that analysis process. Um, we've also built uh, a new tool this was a, a great idea that, that came out of some of our folks in Seattle um, that really uses the same data in a target value design methodology. And so we're able to pull in data from our benchmarking tool, as well as pull in uh, target data that a team would agree to. And, and the nice thing is it's not just target cost data by system, but it's target building parameter data. So you know the same way that we're looking at, at those you know, hundreds of building parameters in our benchmarking tool, we're able to pull out, you know, what are the key cost drivers that we want to focus on for this project, for this system? And then what are the targets that we want to set based on the historical data, based on the challenges of this individual project and the owner's goals, all those things, establish those targets. And so we're able to look at the historical data, the project specific targets, and then also look at kind of where the project stands at any point in time. And because of some of the things you, you, you probably know, Assemble's developed new integrations in the last year or so to Microsoft Power BI, we're able to directly integrate into that report assemble data. So we're able to you know, get the, the model from the design team, quickly pull quantities and integrate it into that report as well. So we're able to provide kind of much more frequent trend data to the, the project team on, hey, here's how our skin efficiency is trending. Here's how our uh, you know, cost per square foot of structural steel is, is trending. Um, and you know, we've gotten really great feedback from our project teams, especially from the designers on, you know, being able to let them know how things are evolving between major milestones so that if, if something does start trending, you know, kind of a little bit above where we were anticipating, we can have that conversation three months earlier, that they're not spending all that time progressing the design and, and getting to the next milestone before they find out, hey, we've got a problem, we got to go back and change something. We're able to tighten up that feedback loop, let them know what we're seeing much more quickly and, and make that course correction before they've invested a whole lot of resources going down a path. So that's been tremendously effective. Um, you know, we, we, we had some challenges around making some of this, uh, some of these reports fully available externally just from a, a technical licensing standpoint, but we've actually invested in a new web app that'll allow us to, to provide kind of external access to a lot of this data uh, so we're, we're doing some beta pilots actually starting next month um, on that new tool. So uh, we, we realized that was something that we, we really want to be able to put this information in the hands of our clients and design team partners uh, to really help everybody on the project make those better decisions. But um, we had some technical hurdles we had to work through there. But the good news is we're, we're hopefully through those and this pilot goes well. And, and uh, that'll be kind of the next frontier for us in the coming months. Well, it's incredibly exciting, really, isn't it? I mean, five years work, seeing it to come to fruition. What does, without kind of uh, being specific to Skanska, what does the future hold? I mean, where does this all end? Not, not that it ends, but what in five years will we be sitting talking about? Um, I mean, there's no doubt the Pre-Construction Podcast believes that the, the future to construction and within pre-construction is technology and talent. Without without either, that, then there's a major, major pitfall. Um, but what does the future hold when it comes to BIM, BDC, Assemble, Data, estimating software what do you think will be the or, or, or in your can you visualize what is the the the, the, the ideal yeah i mean i think you know certainly uh in the short term kind of that, that five-year horizon I, I think we're going to push forward with really standardizing around model-based estimating and and everything that we can do to make sure that our folks are spending their time on the value add activities which to the extent that they can avoid counting things on a set of documents, 
that's more time that they can then spend on using some of these more sophisticated data-driven benchmark tools to really analyze projects and draw insights and find better solutions for clients uh, and, and enhance the accuracy of, of the estimates that we're providing. Um, so, you know, we're not all the way there yet. There's, there's still work that needs to be made. Um, you know, we need to continue to get smarter about that model QC process and, um, you know, designers are going to get more sophisticated with how they model. Uh, you know, we've, we've obviously seen tremendous progress over the last 10 years on, on design models. Um, so, you know, that, that's going to be critical. Uh, and I think the other thing that's going to continue happening kind of on the other side of the business is just data being driven throughout everything that we do. Um, you know, where I think we've had some great advances on the project planning side of the business. I think we'll start seeing that more on the operations side of the business. Um, and really, you know, again, throughout HR, BD, everything that we do, um, I think that'll prompt a lot more challenging conversations, right? Like on, on the pre-con side, um, we've obviously, I think, made some great progress in the last five years. There are some interesting opportunities ahead of us around standardizing our approach to estimating. And, and you know, we, we give people a lot of flexibility around how they create their estimates, what line items they use, how they describe things. And that inherently makes it challenging to do a whole lot of data aggregation and analysis around our actual estimates um, outside of, of the project costs. So, you know, that was why we sort of had to standardize on the certain quantities and parameters that we wanted to collect in our benchmarking tool. But to be able to really directly tie that to the estimates that we're creating and, and the data in the estimates, that's going to be a more challenging process. And I think um, as we get more sophisticated around data and the tools that we have, you know, that, that'll be a next frontier. I think it's a little bit further out there. Um, right now, there's, there's still a little bit of, of brute force in terms of identifying the, the key parameters and pulling them out of the estimate and into our benchmarking tool. Um, so to really be able to fully integrate and streamline everything in the process from the model through the estimate to the, the kind of end of design benchmarking. Um, that's a more challenging process, I think, from a data integrity standpoint without limiting the flexibility that our teams need in, in developing good estimates. Um, so that, you know, there's, <laughs> that, that's a topic that, that could be a, a two or three hour discussion. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, you know, I, I do think as we get more sophisticated in, in you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road, there are really opportunities there, uh, but it's it's a more complicated problem. And there's so many kind of low-hanging fruit opportunities in front of us right now that um, we're, we're going to take advantage of those first and come yeah. back to that harder problem in, in a few years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what's more impre most impressive with what you're saying, Will. Because you guys are involved in so many different markets, that say a general contractor, mid-sized general contractor, only building warehouses or logistics centers or cold storage, like it's pretty standardized anyway. Um, whereas you guys are completely like highly complex, ever evolving projects. Um, you are able to use the data as well as, 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 as you have been. I mean, that, that's, that's really impressive. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, it would be nice to have the luxury of uh, having buildings that were all very, very similar, yeah. all, you know, the exact same use, uh, you know, same design parameters. Um, we don't, we don't get that luxury. We have to deal with the, uh, you know, kind of reconciling in our process, our, our analysis. And it comes back to that whole idea of being able to blend your professional expertise and knowledge with the data to figure out how you have to kind of account for those inherent differences um, and, and, you know, it's interesting, we, we do a, a good example, we do a lot of lab buildings, um, and a lot of them are higher ed, but some of them are, are kind of more private life science, but this, particularly on the higher ed side, you get so many, or such a spectrum of, of different program allocations between, you know, classroom, office, dry lab, wet lab, and, and that has a tr tremendous impact on the building cost, you know, HVAC systems, uh, skin structure, you know, plumbing, electrical needs, all, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, kind of a, a next gen for us is really being able to use some of the information that we have on, on the program side to understand how that influences and drives all those building parameters and the cost. Um, and so, you know, being able to layer some of that machine learning and AI on top of, of the data we have, I think will really help us draw some of those interesting insights that, 
if you're lucky enough to be able to just work on warehouses for the same client over and over, uh, you know, it, it can be a lot more straightforward to to draw those insights because you're not worrying about how you normalize for some of those those other parameters that they're inherently different when you're doing these major complex uh, commercial construction projects. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, love it. Well, well, listen, I don't want to take up any more of your time. This has been incredible. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we've only touched on data, historical data. Uh, there's probably four or five different topics that we're going to come back on uh, within the pre-construction podcast over the next two or three years. Um, really looking forward to following your story, but also Skanska's, Skanska's technology um, story as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on and appreciate you uh, tackling this this topic. It's, um, it's an important one and a, a great opportunity for us all to, to move the industry forward. Exactly. And that, that's the idea. I mean, to be able to learn and share and teach each other without sharing the, the secret sauce, but basically sharing just value adds and, and, and what we really should be looking at. So no, this has been really insightful. Absolutely. Have a good rest of your day.